Do it. Let's get right to the first uh, big guest of the hour. So many on on the docket, but joining us right now exclusively to talk about the new some new ideas about crypto regulation, the rise of retail investors, SPACs, meme stocks, and so much more. SEC Chair Gary Gensler, Mr. Chairman, thank you for joining us this morning. Great to see you. Uh, you just gave a speech all about um, cryptocurrency and and your intention. Uh, to protect investors. And I want to drill down directly into what that means, because I think that there's a, a lot of people, uh, both in the investor community and the policy world, that want to understand the details of that. You said uh, in that speech that this asset class is rife with fraud, scams, and abuse. And I want to understand exactly exactly what you would like to do. So, Andrew, it's been good to be with you. Look, we're an investor protection uh, agency, and right now, this asset class, Bitcoin and the hundreds of other coins that investors are trading in, is a speculative asset class. And if people want to take risk, that's all right. But what we want to do is provide them some of the basic protections against fraud and manipulation. The trading platforms they're on are not currently under a, a, a regulatory regime that protects them like they're trading on the New York Stock Exchange. It just isn't. And I think those are gaps, and I think that's not good for investors, and I don't think it's good for the technology. So what has to happen? Do laws need to change? Do you have the authorities that you need? It's a great question. We have robust authorities, and in some places it's pretty clear. Many of these tokens just given how they were uh, issued and sold and so forth, come under the securities laws. It's a facts and circumstances situation. But then on the trading platforms, as well as the lending platforms, uh, many of those are standing astride uh, regulation. Now, if they're trading securities, they've got to come in, and I'm encouraging them to come in, and let's talk to them. Let's have a frank discussion but many of them right now are trying to stay, you know, dealing with their lawyers and trying to say, we're, well, well, we're not going to come in. And that doesn't really make good sense for the markets. Now, Congress, we're going to also work with Congress to see if we can fill gaps in the authorities. When you say you want to work with Congress and fill in these gaps, what are the, what are the authorities that you don't think you have that you think you need to have in order to ensure this idea of investor protection? I think that the most critical thing is around where we, the public, can go to trade or we, the public, might lend this crypto on a platform. And if the platform has both securities, which many of these tokens are, but also commodities on the same platform, how to deal with that, how to deal with, uh, along with our sibling agency, one that I was honored to chair, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and stitching that a little bit together because some of these platforms have both commodities and securities. You, you just described some crypto as securities. Um, other yeah, SEC many, chairs many, prior many to you are. have not. Um, which ones do you think of as securities? And which ones do you think of more in either a commodity basket or some other kind of asset basket? You know, I, I, Andrew, I hope, hate for your viewers to uh, keep going back to this, but it's pretty clear, and the Supreme Court has actually spoken to, about this many times. Um, if if somebody is raising money, selling a token, and the buyer is, is anticipating prof profits based on the efforts of that group, the sponsor, the seller, that fits into something that's a security. And I'm not going to go token by token. You can imagine why I wouldn't do that. But my predecessor, Jay Clayton, who you have on the show often, Jay said it best about three years ago that he really hadn't seen many tokens that didn't meet that securities test. I'm, I'm looking at a screen. We have a, a screen of cryptocurrencies on the list, Bitcoin, Ether. Other. Would, would Ripple, for, for example? Yeah, Andrew, security? I know you're going to try that, but that's, we, have, we have an enforcement case, and I'm going to leave it at that, Andrew. Um, let, let me think of it. Let me ask you a different question, which is, you're going to the try balance. the same question a different way? No, no, no. In the, no. No, no. In the balance between regulation on one end and innovation on the other, where do you think you lie? Uh, because I think that there's, a, there's a, a large question in this country about where the United States is going to stand long term. 
uh, when it comes to crypto and crypto innovation. You spent uh, three years teaching classes about crypto, so you're an expert in this topic. I'm very pro innovation. I think it helps the economy grow. I think more people get access to finance and access to good medicine, access to good jobs. I think uh, I wouldn't have gone to MIT. I've been a professor there for three years at the intersection of finance and technology among some of the world's remarkable experts at MIT. Um, so I count myself as pro innovation, but I think that we also need rules of the road. Automobile came along 100 plus years ago, and if we didn't have rules of the road, Detroit wouldn't have been able to sell those automobiles, those good factory jobs wouldn't have been created, those good union jobs wouldn't have been created. Right. Without rules of the road, the people had confidence and trust in the automobiles. Similarly, we need trust in markets and trust in finance. This innovation, Satoshi Nakamoto's innovation, uh, if it's gonna meet its potential, needs to come within public policy frameworks. Mr. Chairman, what, what do you say to those crypto proponents who say that the reason we, we like crypto is because in some ways it's anti-government. It, it's effectively trying to live outside of the world of regulation. We actually don't want you to regulate it because that, that actually is part of what gives it its value. It's almost a self-regulating um, currency. Look, it's 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 part of this remarkable story. It's foundation story of Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't even know she, he, or they who they are. It was a little off the grid libertarian movement to have a private form of money. And we've had private monies and public monies in the past. Private monies generally fail over centuries. That part of it is okay. And in fact. It's brought a lot of change. It's a catalyst to central banks around the globe to think about new payment systems and new approaches to money. But at the same time, we want to ensure that we guard against uh, money laundering. We want to guard against terrorists and the ransomware. Bitcoin is used inside of ransomware, the colonial pipeline circumstance of this spring that we all lived through. So I think we can achieve both. Uh, so I'm pro-innovation, but I'm also pro the basic policy norms of investor protection, guarding against illicit activity, financial stability. And, and where do you land on the prospect of a Bitcoin ETF? This has been um, a, a long running question. Lots of folks have come to you and to this agency over the last several years now trying to uh, get a, an ETF approved. What would it take well, we already have some funds in the in the uh, crypto space. Bitcoin, uh, the largest, been around for about seven years. It's not an ETF, but it's uh, been around. It's over twenty billion dollars in size, and we have some mutual funds in this space as well that are investing in Bitcoin futures from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So I would anticipate there'll be some filings in that regard, and I look forward to looking at staff and their review of. Uh, potentially some uh, ETF filings around investing in Bitcoin futures on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange around what we call an aircraft, the 1940 Act. I want to also talk to you about disclosure and, and maybe it relates to the function of memes, meme stocks, but crypto I, I probably comes under this as well. You now have a whole new generation of, uh, of investors going on TikTok, going on Reddit, going on all sorts of other places, promoting either a cryptocurrency or promoting a stock. Where, where does the SEC see their role in that conversation? I think it's, it's the same it's, it's been for decades. It's trying to foster good debate and dialogue, uh, just, just like on this program here, uh, about uh, investing. <clears throat> and the retail engagement is, is positive. Um, but also to guard against fraud and manipulation. And whether that's from big actors, big hedge funds in the markets um, uh, or not. And also to promote transparency. We are taking a real close look at market structure. And uh, I recently started a, you know, uh, engaging on Twitter and to some of those Twitter followers that are writing about dark pools. We are looking very closely at this market structure that so many of our orders, retail public orders, 
are not going to the lit markets, but are going to internalizers, going to wholesalers who are taking the retail public's trades rather than sending them to the stock exchanges. Hey, hey Gary, I, nothing. You're, you're SEC chair. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, I don't want to get no, too familiar. Can, either works. Either works. <laughs> Uh, I'm watching uh, Bitcoin, and, and I, I'm not tying it to anything that you're saying, but I got to tell you that having a, a regulator or a government official just that knows what he's talking about in a calm manner, uh, it, 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 I think it's helping allay some fears that you turn on the light when you look into an abyss. But my question is, you're a professor. You know how to teach people. Did you ever think of, of maybe... I don't know, just sending out an email to some of your uh, colleagues in, in D.C., whether it be at the Fed or in Congress or wherever, and just saying, hey, I'm going to give a little seminar on what crypto actually is. Have you thought about doing that? Because I see things <laughs> from people in a position to do things that show a almost a zero lack of understanding of what we're dealing with here. Well, why don't you offer to do that, to, to educate some of uh, some of your associates down in that in DC. Well, you're, you're kind. I learn every day from talking to my uh, colleagues. I, well, you learn what they don't know. Let, let me just say, I've had wonderful one-on-one -on -one discussions with both senators and members of the House. Sometimes in group sessions. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to share, but I, I compliment senators those and the Treasury Secretary for, for, for this or to Fed. discussion on crypto. Fed chairs, Treasury secretaries, senators, all all. all Everywhere, then. Uh, uh, Secretary Yellen convened a terrific meeting where we talked about stable value coins, and my colleagues, uh, 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 Chair Powell was in the room, and, and uh, uh, Yellen and McWilliams, and uh, Chair Benham. I mean, we were there, the president's working group. We had a really uh, engaged uh, discussion that she chaired. Okay. All right. There's hope. I wanted to ask you two other quick questions uh, while we still have you. Uh, one relates to retail investors, and uh, one of the conundrums that we've we've seen now over the last several weeks and months um, is that they don't seem to vote when it comes to governance. It becomes it's become a very challenging circumstance. So you have a real agency problem, and I'm thinking, by the way, of Adam Aaron not being able to get enough votes from his AMC shareholders, the Apes, and then Lucid needing extra time to get uh, its shareholder vote for its SPAC. Do you think of that as a problem? I think of it as shareholder democracy, that, that we, the owners of companies, I mean, in my current role, I'm not voting any shares, but we, the, the shareholders of corporate America, have to be able to engage and, and, and do that in a way that's, uh, of course, efficient and effective uh, to express our views. So I, I do think about it a lot, and staff is making recommendations about our uh, both the but the problem is this and made, on the shareholder voting. But how, how concerned are you the fact that people just don't vote? I mean, by the way, which is a feature of democracy, but but maybe a problem in the context of a business. So it's what we're looking at is both making it more efficient, and some of that is on the proxy plumbing side and something that's called universal proxy, making it a little easier to compare uh, uh, the votes and, and so forth and the, the ballots. Um, uh, but you're right, it, it, to make it more efficient and make it more available. Mr. Chair, we have literally 30 seconds, but very quickly, China, uh, China stocks, you, you, you've come down with some new rules uh, about disclosures. How concerned are you about the books in China and whether they're accurate or not? I, I, I am concerned. I think that um, for 17 years since uh, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, a bill to reform accounting in America went into being, um, that we have not been able, as Americans through an organization called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, that we, the SEC, oversee, we have not been able to audit the auditors of Chinese related issuers. Number two, I'm concerned that the retail public doesn't yet fully understand that most of these companies are not Chinese companies. They're buying a Cayman Islands company that at best has a service arrangement with the real company in China. And those arrangements, those service arrangements, the Chinese authorities have in the last few weeks we've seen it and may in the future just say, you know, we don't really like the way these arrangements are. And so there's a lot of political risk in addition to the accounting and books and records risk you just mentioned. 
Mr. Chairman, we appreciate uh, you joining us this morning on so many topics. Hope to talk to you again 